This is episode 121 with Chris Ridd. Within the XY community, we've definitely noticed a shift in mindset when it comes to fintech. Instead of questioning whether fintech is going to replace advisors, many advisors now believe fintech can actually complement them and their value proposition for clients. So if this is the case, surely the question then has to be, how can advisors leverage the power of fintech in a post-Royal Commission world? This is a great episode that doesn't just look at the possibilities of fintech, but also great leadership and what it takes to build an awesome company culture, no matter what the size of the business. And with an impressive career history as a leader in tech, both as ex-CEO of Zero and now CEO of My Prosperity, Chris knows more than a thing or two about being an effective leader. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $10 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leading managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. Mr. Chris Reid. Hello, mate. It's good to be here. It's good to be here under uh, such um, sound technical foundations. With um, <laughs> I'm seeing gaffer tape. <laughs> I'm seeing blue tack. <laughs> <laughs> mate, this is what it's. This is life as a startup, mate. This is oh, what it's yeah. all about. Oh yeah. Plastic cups. Mm. Anyway. That's- mm. Well, the um, yeah, I'm I'm just excited that we're going to be able to hear you this time <laughs> compared to our last podcast that we did. You know, that was embarrassing. Here I am as a tech guy and, yeah, yeah it'll all work. You know, we'll do it over the internet and then I had, it, 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 you know, it dropped out about six times. And <laughs> My laughter at it actually, like, overcompensated for, like, oh, shit, the podcast is fucking up. <laughs> I was just so, this is, yeah. the irony was just killing me. But it was, it was good. We yeah. still got some good stuff out. Yeah, but, well, um, anyway, it's good to be here in person. Yeah, it is. It's great to have you on. So we... Um, for those that don't know um, out there, Chris is the one of the leaders, CEO, currency of My Prosperity, and um, yeah, you have been have you've had an awesome history in terms of like financial services in Australia. Yeah, look, it's been I've been very fortunate had um, the opportunity to work in big corporate and um, and then. I guess late in my career, make the jump into startups because and not a lot of people do it, which I've been doing a bit of reading and listening to other podcasts and things, and it it, it is a bit unusual. But um, yeah, what well, what an opportunity! You know, running zero and then getting involved with my prosperity and a few other startups along the way, and and learning a lot. So it's been really fun. What sort of things have you with, with these startups? What have you been looking out for? Like obviously you got my prosperity, <laughs> and a lot of people would have heard the story around that. But some of these other ones that you've been looking at, what do you? Well, look, obviously, I learned a lot out of the Zero experience, not only what Zero did um, and what we, I was involved in there, um, but in and around the ecosystem, you know, I saw a lot of businesses get going and do really well. And uh, and you kind of learn a bit about the formula that goes into those fintechs that make them successful. I mean, Zero in, its, in itself was, was a little bit of a bubble. I mean, people go, oh, you know, it's amazing having worked for a startup like Zero, but it's not normal to raise $450 million, particularly in this part of the world. So, that, so we, it did, um, you know, it, it meant that um, we were a little spoiled because not- That was the no, IPO or- oh, no, no, it was just on the- We were already listed, so- Oh, Zero, and then you did another Zero, race. Yeah. No, it was Zero listed, and, and then they were just, you know, in, institutional investors along the journey. Wow. Um, so to raise 450 million, and that that kind of <laughs> it's unusual, and so you, you get a bit spoiled. You, you you're not short of capital, um, yeah. and and as I learnt <laughs> after zero, um, capital is gold, and it's not easy to get. Yeah. And um, so so I learnt that in 2016 because I got involved in a few fintechs and or startups and different technology companies. And um, so what do I look for? I mean, there's three things. Firstly, the founders. So mm. the people behind it mm. was number one. And I learned that probably the hard way because mm. I got involved in one. And by the way, I'm not going to mention names here, of right? So, yeah, yeah. But there was one I got involved in for probably the wrong reasons and, and learned very quickly that people made a big difference. And they were people that, you know, that I, I want to be able to respect and trust and, and also have the passion, that sort of that burning desire to want to succeed. And um, and so I'd look for that. The other thing was really the compelling text, so something I could get passionate about, so mm-hmm. something that I really believe in. You see a lot of technology, and some of it's good ideas, but unless I really felt in my gut, like, yeah, that's really cool, 
um, I typically steer away from it. And then the third one, selfishly, was was um, commercial upside for me. I mean, uh, yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna spend your time in something, and I I always look for things that were early stage. Um, you know, there's a lot of good companies. There's one in particular, again, no names mentioned, but there was one that I was looking at at, at, at having a tilt at the CEO role, but they'd already listed and done really well. And I was thinking, well. I'm going to be spending three years sort of chasing that valuation. I'd rather get involved in something where I can help shape it mm. and then the multiples can be... Yeah, instead of coming in at like a P of 40 and having to... Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then you just... Backfill the, the <laughs> earnings. <laughs> yeah, look, and I didn't want to do that. And and you see it often. You see, you know, even to the point where there was one startup actually, you know, awesome founder, awesome tech, but very racy valuation. And, uh, and they were looking at a pre-IPO round and I didn't get involved because I just felt, well... It just doesn't look realistic to me, and sure enough, it wasn't. Um, there was, you know, some, some, some blood down the track with them. But you know, and it's just, I, I guess, in summary, this is a hard space. You know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of people having crack at startups and technology companies and fintechs, and um, and, and it's quite often, you, you, you know, it's it's fraught with danger in terms of trying to pick mm. you know, the right ones. Tell us but, about um, it. <laughs> yeah, um, you, know, you know, like, and there's, yeah, you, Clay's nodding with a lot of. Um well, yeah, obviously I've been in a few startups um, and and invested in, in in one or two as well. So, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting interesting little world. Yeah. yeah. We'll talk about starting up new things. Um, we just talked before, and uh, you've got a bit of a, a new sort of um, hobby or uh, pastime. That's or, or would you say maybe like someone's gonna. If you pay yourself, does that count as you running another business? Or What's that? Sorry, for the building? <laughs> well, no, it was something, yeah, because we were talking before I came on. Yeah, look, it's a little it's a little project. Um, hopefully it's sort of little-ish. It doesn't turn into a, like a, a big nightmare next year. But um, no, look, I, I have a bit of a <laughs> – Famous I've last had, words. Well, I've had a bit of a bucket list item to actually um, build a beach house. and, and That's we've got so a, cool. We've got a place down the coast, and I'm going to have a crack at that. So I'm actually doing – to, to prepare myself for that, I'm actually doing um, a, a, a number of building electives, which are practical kind of short course electives. At TAFE? At TAFE. Oh, yes. It's so good. I go in there and it's funny because you kick off and they sort of, you're going around and there's a lot of, you know, uh, migrants and other people from all sorts of different backgrounds. They get to me, what are you doing? I, I, I run a tech company. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm just, you know, I've, I've now learnt to water it down because they're all like, you know, what are you doing? So, um, but look, it's great, you know, and I'm just learning a new skill. So, you know, I'm 51 and... My son is actually doing uh, his pre-apprenticeship in carpentry and he's been coming home telling me about all his what he's doing. I'm so jealous. I'm going, oh, I've always wanted to, you know, get my hands into wood and work with that and just really understand how it all works. And actually it was funny because my brother-in-law was really handy and he was a very senior advertising exec. And um, uh, well, recently I, I, we, we've got another property and he was just doing up the bathroom. And I said to him, mate, this is such an awesome job. Like, where'd you learn this? And he said, oh, I spent 18 months, you know, down the coast working for a builder when I finished at, you know, the agency. And I was like, oh, it's so cool. So anyway, we'll see how it goes. It's not going to consume me but because I'm going to stay involved in tech. But it is one of those little pet projects that I've kind of always had in the back burner. Awesome. And here I am. I'm actually going to gonna do it. Man, that's so cool. Yeah. Oh, I, I think there's something because working in finance – uh, financial planning and and money and it's it's all it's very it's 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 you know you get soft hands you get soft <laughs> hands don't you and and, and you, desk hands yeah desk hands is, is a good way to do it um, and there's something about just flipping that and and doing something a, a bit more down to the roots like some uh, blisters. Mm. Getting blisters, uh, Big calluses, calluses, all that, all that sort of physicality, which, which I think you know, super. Starting to important. have second thoughts now. No, like, it's a different type. Chris of is challenge. looking at his hands, guys. It's just like oh, <laughs> I, know, I really soft. like these guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll get, get me back in a year. I'll come in. I'll have like a beard, and I'll be you yeah. know, all these cuts and bruises, and maybe a missing finger, a couple of tattoos. Um, but <laughs> but <laughs> no, I won't be doing that. Um, but no, look, it's it's just it's going to be a different type of challenge um, and, and, and a nice balance because I do want to stay involved in tech and I'm obviously going to stay involved with my prosperity, a business I love, I think I'm really passionate about, albeit I'll be in a different sort of capacity, less operational, more strategy, um, as well as some other startups that I'm involved in. Mm. And uh, it, yeah, I'll just see how it goes. It's going to be nice to have a little bit. Of, it is nice, okay, you know, on occasions through your career, and I've, I've, I've managed to have the opportunity to do it a couple of times where you can actually sit back and reflect. And 2016, I've left Zero because I was a bit burnt out after Zero. I was kind of really felt I needed a bit of a break. And I did take a break and I spent some time with family. I did some little bit of travel and some other things. And and it just allowed me time just to sort of sit back and think, well, what, what do I want to do next? Um, and confirmed I did want to stay in tech. 
um, and just, you know, probably learnt more that year in many respects than I did in the whole five years. So particularly about wow. having worked with a number of different tech companies because I didn't invest in all of them, but I did mm. a number of projects. And it's really interesting. I, I still track the progress of some of those those um, startups that I help consult and some of them are doing well and others aren't. And it's mm. you, you sort of get a bit of a feel for what, you know, what the formula is, I still haven't quite figured it out, but it's it's a it's a really if it, we, space. I think if it was that easy to figure out, there'd be a lot of rich people cruising around. Um. Yeah, well, you know, they, everyone's getting into startups. It must be easy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, piece uh, piece cake. Yeah. <laughs> Um, a huge, I mean, a huge part of our listener base are, are business owners, are, yeah. are financial planners, and um, w- w- okay, so they're obviously going to be very familiar with with my prosperity. Obviously, it coming out of nowhere a few years ago, and then uh, sort of being everywhere now. Mm. Um, what are you finding as far as the? Do you find that accountants or financial planners are getting most out of that software at the moment? Yeah, it's it's both. Uh, and increasingly accountants, although I would say that probably it's probably about 50-50, but having said that, the accountants tend to be multidisciplinary and may have an AFSL or at least a, 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 an advisor or planner that they'll refer. Um, there is a lot of consolidation, as you know, going on in the industry, you know, with accounting firms buying up financial advice firms. And um, uh, so so I'd say it's, it's, it's 50-50. What, what we are seeing is accountants that are really wanting to unlock the potential of what's happening with the individual clients. So for years, they might have been doing small business advisory and, you know, the books for the, the business, you know, the business owner and the tax and all those things and, and and have really sort of overlooked the person behind the business and what's happening in their financial world. So, and that really came to the fore a year ago when we were on the road and I was meeting with some of the old zero partners that were interested. Oh, you've now running this, tell us about it. And they were signing up and getting clients on and going, well, we're actually unlocking a whole lot of stuff that we mm. previously couldn't because we didn't have a platform to do it. Yes. Um, so we're looking to really start to expand that. We've recently announced a partnership with Spotlight Reporting and they're very heavily involved in that accounting space. And what they can do now is consolidate a reporting. So you're looking at, uh, geez, we very quickly got down into business, didn't we? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they can very quickly... Uh, look at the business side as well as the personal side and track all that and give that to the advisor. Yeah, it's pretty cool tool. I've played around with it. Yeah, so that's that's um, almost ready to go live. We've been in beta for some time. So, but but it really taps into the potential that we're seeing in accounting. But financial planning certainly is kind of our bread and butter. Uh, what what do you think the future of advice is? If you consider the Royal Commission, if you consider um, you know, this movement to cash flow, this movement to overall financial planning is holistic. Uh, what do you see as, as, a, as the key way for an advisor to, to not only exist but flourish in the next, say, five to ten? Yeah, look, I mean, I'm not going to use all the, you know, you can pick up the paper and read all about, you know, how we're moving away from product alignment and, you know, um, trial commissions going away and it's fee for service and it's got to be, you know, value proposition. I, probably the best way to answer that question is to look at my own experience. And um, and I've told this story a number of times about how I got involved in my prosperity, which was back in July 2015. And, you know, I was at zero and I remember um, my advisor contacted me because, you know, he, he was a, an avid zero partner and obviously, you know, I'd got involved. I had the luxury as a CEO of zero to sort of look around and go, who's the good advisors out there, you know? <laughs> um, and... Um, but, you know, I, the dirty secret in Zero, I was complaining to him saying, because I was using Zero Cashbook, nothing wrong with the product. And in fact, it's like a lot of the PFM, what I call PFM products on the market that just focus on cash flow and budgeting. Mm. And and whilst it adds, you know, there's, there's certainly a place for that. Um, what I was finding with my own finances was that um, whilst it was good to know where my money was going and how I could budget better, at the end of the day, I still felt out of control because I had you know, insurance is sitting in a filing cabinet. I had a will, you know, I've got, you know, share, a direct share portfolio. I had, um, you know, um, quarry wrap, um, you know, for some investments and then a self-managed super fund and some property, you know, and I'm, I'm going, you know, I was saying to my advisor, look, I'm still out of control. All this stuff's everywhere. And so when he showed me my prosperity and I started using it, to me, that was the first time I felt in control. So in answer to your question, I think the starting point for any advice, if I, and, and this might sound really like I'm simplifying it, but I, ha, I absolutely think that the starting point for any advisor, if you really want to add value to your clients, is just get them feeling in control. Because most of us, 
And, and I often talk about this and, you know, you talk about all the apps out there that help you, you know, manage your photos and manage your music and your fitness and, you know, home, you know, stuff. And, um, you know, we, we, it helps us feel in control of certain parts of our life. But financial, plan, uh, financial advice or at least personal finance management, um, I think technology has overlooked it. And so for me, the experience of 26 years in my career, first time I turned around, I said, holy shit, it's all there in one place. That's great. What a great feeling. So I think that's the starting point of advice and technology can solve that problem. From there, of course, then it's about once you've got the data is understanding the client and then being able to actually provide the advice that's relevant. But what I found when I came into my prosperity was that most advisors don't have that data. Uh, or if they do, they're managing it at a back end system, you know, might be using X plan or whatever. Um, but typically it's 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 not in real time. So and they're not able to use any data analytics to really, you know, go in and actually have the right conversations. And that's what we're seeing really the transformation. So that's why I got involved because I just felt it was such a big gap and I experienced it myself. Yeah, wow. Yeah, it's, um, it's a really exciting, I think what you're saying before around uh, financial planning or financial advice just being completely overlooked. It's it's so true. And it and it's still, there's this time lag that's still playing out. Like it's it's still early days for some of the cool stuff that's going to be coming through. So it's yeah. really, really exciting. Well, the good thing is there's a lot of really good innovation coming in, you know, um, whether it be robo advice or, you know, there's a whole, I mean, there's a lot, what was it, something like about $15.2 billion that was invested in fintech last year. That's globally. Um, and so I think certainly advisors are not going to be starved with choice. It's really a matter of understanding what's, <laughs> what's going to help them make the transition. I think at the moment with the Royal Commission that we're, we're finding a lot of advisors are really <clears throat> concerned and it's almost like they're, um, they're in fear of making decisions because they're just wanting to see how things play out. And I understand that. I mean, someone really close to me, I should be really careful. No, I can say it. My brother was a financial advisor. I only hesitate because he just sold his business. Right. But it's been a really interesting dynamic mm. but in our family because here's me kind of riding the wave of technology you know, seeing the opportunity that Royal Commission brings for technology to help advisors, and obviously we're benefiting from that. And on the other hand, my brother, who's a financial advisor, has been has his own had his own AFSL has for seventeen years, and deciding, you know, what time's up? The Royal Commission's made it really hard. Additional compliance, you know, fascia, um, you know, the fact that you know. Uh, I mean, let's face it, it hasn't helped the profile of financial advisors to clients. Some clients are now really questioning them, mm -hmm. um, you know, not too dissimilar, dissimilar to a lot of financial advisors where he has a reliance on trial commissions through some of the insurance that he sold over that journey and some that are active and looking at it and just weighing it up. And I said to him, hey, what about my prosperity? And, and this is one of the things we're finding is that, you know, this is the difference between advisors. He, does, he didn't want to embrace technology. He's never been into technology. I'm going. This can this can help, and it's like no, no, no. I'm I'm, I'm getting out. That's so he's and out. That's where they're like, Chris, you're not taking care of sales anymore. You couldn't even sell your own brother. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I should. If I'm going to get a job in sales, I shouldn't tell that story. It's like, you couldn't even sell it to your own brother. Um, but no, I think it's it's been a really. Uh, We've never got a no. <laughs> yeah, it's been a real because like, it's really close to home and seeing that play out because it's not just you know because because we're out pitching technology, but. What it's helped me really understand, and I've seen this because I know a lot of the advisors out there that are really struggling, because it is a difficult time for a lot of them to understand how do I survive and in fact thrive post royal commission. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm a huge believer that technology can play a massive role in that, and but some will elect to get out, and I think that's going to happen more and more. We're going to see a lot of people leave the industry, not just because of fascia, but that is a big, mm. that is a big requirement, and it's one that you know a lot of you know because in my vintage and Andrew is 15 months older than me, that's my brother. And he said, well, I'm not going to go back to uni. I mean, and a lot aren't, you know. Mm. And he's he's a bloody good financial advisor. Mm. Yeah. You know, so he's offered me a lot of stuff over the years. He's really good. But, you know, and that's a loss for the industry. Mm. It Absolutely. really is. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. a bit of a, yeah, it's the flip side of, um, I guess, raising the bar. It's sort of, unfortunately, there's going to be some people that are amazing out there that aren't going to be. Yeah, I think, I think long term, five, ten years in the future, we'll be all very happy that these these increased requirements have come in. But in the meantime, it's going to be a fair few casualties uh, in the form of, of your brother, um, but also, which is a loss to the industry. Um, mm. 
It'd be great to interview him. <laughs> yeah, we should, <laughs> keep, some actually, of that, keep some of that. What's IP it like on the, the other industry? side? Oh, yeah. mate, see, see, he's he's got a little acreage down near the coast now, so he's you know he's actually looking at a complete change, um, right. which is great. So, um, is he into is he into surfing guitar as well? No, but he's into labouring, and I think I'm going to I'm going to hire him to help me with the beach house. <laughs> <laughs> so, Convenient uh, timing. I was, actually, I was going to say around the the Royal Commission, so everyone's, like, we're talking about the public perception, but I think what's really hitting, you, you've, there's been issues with public perception, that's always a, a problem, but when you're dealing with that and you're confident about what you're doing, you know where your business is going, mm. your business, you, you know what your proposition is, there's no threats against your proposition and what you're doing and how you do things. Yeah. The difference about the current situation, I don't think the Royal Commission would have would be hurting as much with advisors personally without everything else that's going on. So they're, they're sitting there second-guessing how they've been doing things yeah. for a lot of years. Yeah. And uh, don't get me wrong. Look, I am generalising because you're right. There are a number of advisors out there that are, I think, going to absolutely smash it because, the, you know, it was really interesting, actually. I, was, I, I presented at a conference. And, look, I, I, my background is not financial advice industry, right? So I've, it's been a real learning curve for me. But I, I presented at this conference and... After I'd finished, you know, I was chatting to a few guys and there was one in particular who was really switched on. And, and I said, because here's me thinking Royal Commission, bad for industry, bad for everyone, you know, it's going to be a lot of uncertainty, blah, 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 you know, talking to my brother, talking to others, you know, yeah, it's all evil. And he goes, no, bring it on. Like, it's overdue. Like, we've got to clean it up. And, and you know, I'm seeing, we are seeing a lot of advisors that are, are really getting on the front foot. And they'll do really well and, and good on them because, like you say, they're confident. They've already, you know, and this is one of the things. There's a lot of most advisors out there have been doing the right thing or really trying to do the right thing by the clients, um, and this is now an opportunity I think to really look at okay, well there's nothing like you know compliance and regulation to change the way things need to be done, um, and there's some that are in an awesome position to really capitalise on that. So I, I think what we're going to see is you're going to see some financial advisors really do well, and, and you know. So I don't I don't want to generalise. You know, mm. there's 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 people looking at it quite differently. Well, I think within within the next as that lag on technology catches up, I think that's how that's going to really close the gap for a lot of people. So mm. a lot of a lot of people's pain is going to disappear as the technology gap closes around the compliance requirements. Yeah, and I guess hopefully one of the outcomes of the Royal Commission is that things get. Like you get the same intent and the outcome that it's looking to see, but you get a bit of a condensing of what the requirements are mm. and it's a bit more streamlined. Yeah. And if you get that, then things will be back on track and there's going to be happy advisors out there. Yeah. But I, I come back to the point, I think, whether it's us or other innovators in the market, um, there are a lot of, you know, you mentioned compliance and, you know, when I'm obviously having been a client of financial advisor, I understand some of the compliance requirements, but... You know, you take things like fact find, right? I mean, that is, that's horrendous how it's been done today. And, you know, we started looking at that and, and just in the process of launching uh, a digital fact find, which is basically a client wizard that uses a lot of data that's already in the platform. So you're not actually having to repeat a whole lot of stuff, right? So Interesting. And it, and it produces this really nice experience. And every time we demo it, people just go, oh, my God, you know, because they're looking at it going, well, what you do today, it's paper, so it lives in files and the client experience is horrendous, yeah, right? So I come, back to, I come back to a point. You are now dealing as an advisor, you're dealing with clients that are informed about good tech, right? They are using all of these great apps to run their lives and suddenly you make them fill out a friggin' PDF paper form. printed out. <laughs> it's horrendous. Why do that to your client? You know, even things like simple stuff like, and I know I've been advocating this for years, but my prosperity, like, so... We have digital doc signing in the platform. Now, there's a lot of, you don't have to use ours. There's other technologies available, but the number of advisors that are making clients print out documents, sign them, scan them, and send them back via email, it's just unforgivable. Mm. They should be shot. <laughs> no, I, I go a bit far, but, but seriously, the technology's not new, and it's actually more secure. The way that these platforms work around digital document signing, it's actually, it's more secure than a wet signature in many cases. Um, we won't go into all that, but... But you know, but but think about it. Like we've had partners that have gone. Well, we just we went with your platform because we've got digital doc signing, and it's saving us weeks. 
because the turnaround with clients all over the place was taking, you know, on average, you know, two months to get stuff back. And now it's taking a matter of a couple of weeks. So there's all that. So there's a whole lot of opportunities there. You know, even the guys, you know, we, we, we had a look at, you probably have them on your program at some point, but uh, Joel from Nod, mm. uh, Joel Robbie. And, yeah. uh, you know, looking at what those guys are doing using AI to actually produce statements of advice based yeah. on similar clients. Like, that's really clever. Like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because you know, my situation is going to be similar to a lot of other clients. So why not try and use AI to determine, well, this is, a you know, how you would build a statement of advice for someone of Chris's profile. I don't know how it all works in the background, but but um, it just seems like a really clever concept. But, you know, SOAs can take so much effort and that's a compliance requirement. So why don't you use the technology to do the heavy lifting? So I guess the theme here is there's so much good technology that's going to take away the stuff that, quite frankly, as an advisor, you really don't want to do. Absolutely. You know, you don't want to do that. Like I saw that w- when I was at zero with accounting. I remember, you know, so you're looking at data entry, right? So, you know, the fact that you could now read receipts and do all this, you know, bank feeds coming in. Data, in the early days, data entry, it was the death of data entry, right? And uh, albeit that we had some bookkeepers going, oh, you're putting me out of business. But I'm going, dude, if you are into data entry as your value proposition, that's I, not. I, I can't help you. It's not a sustainable <laughs> business model. Um, so the technology doing the heavy lifting, and this is what we're going to see more of. So if you want to scale, if you want to, you know, have compliance that's taken care of from technology and, and you know, have – do what you got, what went into business to do as a financial advisor, which is sit in front of clients and actually provide advice and help them achieve their financial goals. That's what most advisors got into it for. Yes. So, so I think what we're going to see post-Royal Commission is a wonderful opportunity with technology really coming to the fore and actually helping – the industry do a lot better and provide actually better results for clients. I'm super interested to see if there's a solution that that nails it. Because if you think about it, um, Mark Boris did remarkably well with with Wizard and then leaves to start Yellow Brick Road uh, and then very quickly realises that it's a lot harder in financial planning than it is in mortgages. And the strange thing is... Uh, to date, no one has cracked that code. So the financial planning industry is hugely fragmented. It's still, you can have one man bands um, and, and there's no giant player that's that's been able to nail it. Mm. With all these tech options coming in and, and being in tech now for a little while, I've finally realized why tech exists. Um, so for example, in XY Advisor, we only, uh, we only do something with tech now if the manual uh, process has become so frequent that we have to figure out a way to automate it. Mm. And so and so tech, rather than just being this thing for everything, which Adrian would love it to be, <laughs> <laughs> it's now very specifically to, to automate manual items that, that yeah. go, f- you know, far too long. <coughs> so I'm, I'm interested and I can't wait for someone, because the, the, the moment that someone actually figures out a way to automate a lot of this financial advice stuff in a good way, I think we will finally see a big player in the financial planning market. And I can't wait to see it. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a good point. Um, I don't think tech's going to replace the need. You know, I had a situation last week where, you know, I really needed to speak to my financial advisor about some stuff. And, um, you know, no amount of robo-advice or do-it-yourself or anything is going to replace that because he knows my situation and some of it was tricky and, you know, it was just... Yeah, it was just that peace of mind knowing I could pick up the phone and actually have that conversation. Yeah. But in the background of that, you know, he's got all my data, right? So he's not sort of having to ask all this question. I, I'd imagine, you know, that would happen a lot. And we have a lot of advice. So, you know, we're just sick of – we're using a platform because we're sick of people coming in and just having to ask all these stupid questions. We should mm. we should know. And it's really hard to, to have that data. But, yeah. you know, do you still have that, that investment property or, you know, whatever it might be. But – um. Um, so that that doesn't replace it. I come back to the point of helping people get in control because you talk about yeah. technology helping. Um, you know, it was interesting. Um, we're quoting recently. What was it? Um, but um, oh, anyway, I was, I was on an, another podcast. I think it was talking about investment trend survey about two years ago that said that ninety two percent of Australians are worried about their financial situation, which is a lot, right? And this is why Scott Pape's books so, sell so well. You know, yeah. you read some of that stuff, and it's really good tips. And because everyone's concerned, like. I can almost say everyone because it's 92%. Yeah. But only 14% of Australians use a financial planner, right? And so you think about where is it going? I, I do think – I'll come back, and this is one of the reasons I got involved in my prosperity, and this is not a plug just for my prosperity, but I do think 
the starting point for any good advice is just helping clients feel con- in control. They're all going to be different. So no one's going to have, you know, millions of dollars or anything. But even someone just starting out to know that, okay, there's my personal balance sheet. I've set up my team, right? Okay, I've got my insurance in one place. Okay, I've got a basic will, but it's all in one place and I know where it is. Yeah. Uh, and then you can set some goals. Okay, I'm going to set some goals to save money. Yeah. Blah, 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 you know, et cetera, et cetera, right up to the high net worth family office where they've got sophisticated investments with all sorts of structures and lots and lots of documents and shareholdings and things, again, all in one place. It's actually surprising. You, you speak to some of the really big, big accounting and other financial planning firms like, oh, you know, family office is really sophisticated. But you speak to anyone running a family office, they're just as much out of control. <laughs> <laughs> they just want to show me on a mobile app where all the shit is. Yeah, I just want wow. to know how much am I worth Yeah, and where are those bloody documents? Yeah. And that's what we solve. So, I mean, I, I just mm. think that's – and then from there, you know, yeah, I think that's the starting point. It's a, it's and I'd huge... love to see our mission. I'd love to – because we don't go direct. It's all about the advisor. I would love to see that 14% be 40% one day. Absolutely. You know, and, and that's our hope that that'll happen. Now, it probably won't, but, you know, we, we firmly believe the advice industry uh, is not going to go away. Yeah. But it does need to change. It's changing, you know, albeit, you know, with a bit of sort of negative flair going on around it. But yeah. I think technology, combination of technology and good advice, I think is where we want to see it head. Yeah, it's definitely a new frontier to be delivered to the marketplace. Yeah. Like. So besides um, besides building, how, how do you um, – I, I always like hearing about, like, your experience managing people and, like, running people in an organisation because, yeah. like, I guess a lot of our listen, listeners are – they're managing people or trying to. Yeah. Um, like, what would be some of your, your top tips to, to people when? Well, I, um, you know, I sort of grew up in big corporate and the start of my career, I won't mention the name of the company, but, you know, it was a really blokey culture. And, you know, you're just out of uni. You don't really know good from bad. You're sort of like, oh, this is what corporate's like. It wasn't until years later reflecting back that I thought, oh, that was a really, it wasn't toxic culture, but it wasn't healthy. Um, I spent 15 years at Microsoft and Microsoft was uh, a great organ is was for me a great organization to work in um, very entrepreneurial culture particularly when I got started in there um, back in the mid 90s and and also worked under some amazing leaders uh, one of whom now is running zero which is Steve Amos so he was my mentor in the sort of latter days he ended up going off to the US but now he's he's taken over Rod's role so um, and Steve, you know, like, like a lot of leaders that I sort of came through with, you know, and Microsoft very much from the outset was um, was big on investing in people and was, was strong on uh, the importance of leadership and, and culture. And so, so I sort of had that ingrained in me and bringing that into a small startup, you don't necessarily need all those bits, but it was interesting actually running Zero because I started at Zero with six staff and ended up- Get out of town. No, yeah, it was six staff and they ended up, like when I left, there was 300. Wow, Ziz. Yeah, and I got marched out of there by HR. So don't ask me about culture. No, no. It was, um, <laughs> it, was, um, it was a great experience. But, you know, I was kind of tapping into a lot of what I'd seen and, and sort of learned along that journey. I think for me, good cultures and, you know, if it comes to leadership, it's, you know, it's firstly understanding your own leadership style uh, and not trying to be anyone else. Um, it's also, you know, just some of the things on that, you know, leaders cast long shadows. So people watch every move. And so there's really interesting things at play in organisations where certain behaviours, I think really importantly, you've got to set, a, you, you need a set of values that you, you kind of all stand for, which people kind of rally behind. Have diverse cultures, yep, that's really, really important. But I think, you know, have some some sort of values that you, you, you sort of instill that really reflect who you are as an organisation and ensure that all the behaviours sort of map into that because what can often happen is, you, you know, you, you, we've all heard, heard of organisations have values but it's kind of, you know, oh, yeah. BS, it doesn't, they don't really live it. And this is one of the things, sometimes those little small behaviours that, that you actually look past can really define the culture and people notice it. People aren't silly. So, you know, if there's a... I won't give you an example. You know, if, if something happens or there's a discussion or if there's a you know a problem within you know the team or whatever, and leaders sort of don't do anything about it, that's the worst thing. Like you know things drag on and fester and so forth. Suddenly people start leaving, and so I reckon one of the key things I've learned is really be on top of the behaviours that you want to drive within the organisation and really be visible about reinforcing those behaviours. You know, cultures are a really fickle thing. You can lose it very quickly. Um, and so I think that's just something you've got to work on. The other thing is I think, you know, um, um, building a strong leadership team because you can't do it all. Like you look at these organisations, you've got awesome leaders and you go, oh, they're amazing. 
But usually beneath them, there's a really awesome team that really uh, have their back and that really understand how to support one another. And, and that, that needs to flow through the organisation in terms of the sort of culture and, and values that you're trying to instil within. With, with the, um, I guess, like all leaders, no one's perfect. Everyone's always got um, preferences in the way they behave mm-hmm. and stronger skills than otherwise. Yep. Um, is it is it is that is that what you use to go? Okay, well, I'm good over here. I've always struggled over here. I really want to be better <laughs> over here, and you put effort into it. But as much as you sort of try in a space that is really not your cup of tea. Is that how you identify who comes in and supports to yeah. close gaps like that? Yeah, or? potentially. But that in itself is is a really good point around leadership style because I think in, in an old school organisation, the leader feels that they need to know everything and that they need to want to be the one who has all the answers and, and appear strong and really, you know, um, in control. Um, one of the things I learned, I remember... Um, I remember when Vamos first came to Microsoft and there's a notion and a, and a terminology going around at the moment if you read you know, a lot of stuff on leadership around this notion of vulnerability. So a leader that has vulnerability is one that will freely admit, I don't have all the answers or they'll admit mistakes or they'll demonstrate vulnerability in a way that people just, it's so, di- it's so empowering for, within an organisation if a leader can stand up and go, and this is what Vamos did, he said, look, I know we have some challenges in the business and he said, I'm going to be really honest with you, I'm not coming in here with all the answers. But I reckon within this room we can figure it out, right? So suddenly we're like, shit. It's like so he's he's asking for help. Mm. So he doesn't have all the answers. Shit, I want to help this guy because he's just so genuine and authentic. And so and and it was authentic and it needs to be authentic. So that's the other thing. Authenticity is really really important. You can't bullshit people. Yeah. So you, you can't, know, can you? You cannot. You yeah. cannot. So and that was one of the things I learned really early on was like it's okay not to have the answer. And to be able to turn to your stuff and go, look, you know, hey, look, I'm feeling really shit about this or, man, that didn't go the way I wanted it to or I made a big, big mistake here and, look, you know. And it's really funny how it's um, uh, it just gives people permission to, to want to come and help. And the last thing you want to do is, you know, be really, you know, that sort of dominant – it's not my style anyway, but to be that really full-on dominant character because what you do basically is shut down debate or you shut down ideas. Some of the best ideas throughout my journey have come from people – that have just sort of walked in and gone, hey, you know, you're talking about that thing. Um, what if we tried this? Or, you know, and it's like, it might be someone that's like a level or two down and you just go, oh, that's a really good idea, actually. Let's have a chat about that. So, and that's what you want. You want that creativity to sort of come from the ground. Because quite often it's the people out, you know, that are in front of partners every day or customers every day are the ones that are going to have some really good ideas or at least they're going to give you the signals to say, you know what, we're on the wrong track. Yeah. And it's really, really important because that keeps your finger on the pulse. There's so many benefits that come with that. Um, but, yeah, there's some of the things I've kind of learned along the journey. And I guess, like, as a, as a leader, you, you've always got – there's a long list of things that you've got to achieve and do and there's a whole lot of priorities. How do you, how do you go about prioritising? Oh, God, that's a hard one. I think um, – um, I, I think again, as a as a leadership team, you know, the the most important priorities really come down to um, you know setting a, a you know the strategic direction of the business, and you know if it's you know if it's in the short to medium term, if, if it's all about revenue, then that has to be the priority that you set for the business because that's important. You've got to have money coming in. Mm. Um, there may be a range of challenges in the business. I think it's a, a matter of the leadership team to agree that, and then. You know, basically go and do it, and that sounds really basic, I know, but um, but I, I think that that you know, again, it comes down to understanding and, and figuring that out as a at a leadership team at a strategic level, and then prioritising accordingly. But it's it's the biggest challenge, isn't it? Because particularly so, if you're if you're in the box seat as CEO, uh, there's so many things to do. Mm. So you know, you can't do them all, and I think delegation is one of the biggest challenges. So there's a whole lot of things that come out of that question. Do you, do you subscribe to the um, it's what you say no to that defines? Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. I know that. Um, I know that certainly. If I think back, probably the most relevant would have been zero, where you know in the early days there was a hell of a lot of stuff that was falling in my lap and opportunities coming out of every different you know direction and lots of people coming in. Oh, no, you know, I, we got the silver bullet to help you grow and all this sort of stuff. And um, I learned the hard way because I went down a rat hole with one particular partnership that that went nowhere. And I spent months kind of back in this thing. I was like, oh, you know. And so I learned to say no, you know, to really suss things out and decide early and really stick to what's going to move the needle. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, I think um, 
you, then they're not always popular decisions when you say no. You Actually, that's a, that's a really good topic. Uh, for the advisors out there that are looking to grow their business, uh, as someone who's been a part of a huge amount of growth, what would you say is the best thing they could do to grow their business? Oh, sign up to my prosperity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you led me into that one. No, look, I think um, I think right now, um, I, I think you've just got to focus on the client, you know, because there's... I think the industry, like I saw this when I came in, that there was so much focus on the back end administration and all this, you know, compliance and blah blah blah, you know. Um, and and I'm sure there's some advisors doing it phenomenally well, um, but I I just think you know understanding how you're going to best service your client. Um, I even spoke to one the other day. He said, you know, what's your focus right now? He said, oh, figuring out which clients to fire. And I went, cool, yeah, that's a good one. That's hard. But he said, but we've got a lot of unprofitable clients. It's it's forced us, everything that's going on has forced us to go back mm. and look at um, who we are and what we want to be mm. and then what are the services and then the type of clients that we want to build. Uh, and that means that there's certain clients that are just wasting our time or just not generating any upside for the business. So um, so that's their focus. So I think, um, I think it's just the I, – I think right now is a really good time to just go back and reassess what do you actually want to be as a business, you know, what do you want to stand for. What's your mission? What do you, you know, where do you want to be in five, ten years? Do you want to be in the industry? Do you want to sell up? You know, blah blah blah, and just sort of figure out a strategic plan um, and go forward. Some of them, some of them are already there and doing it and, and doing well. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I think we're sort of towards the end of uh, the podcast. But Chris, before we before we duck out, yes. Anything you'd like to share about upcoming activity with My Prosperity, people to look out for anything in particular? Um, we, My Prosperity. So, you know, you're typically going into a, a quiet time of year where, you know, we're winding down for Christmas. It's not that far away. Um, and I'm always of the view that particularly having been through that myself, you know, you got a lot of clients that come into January and they're going to be thinking, shit, I need to get my finances sorted out. Yeah. It's an awesome time. So Christmas cards, is that way? No, no. <laughs> no, I reckon if you're thinking about technology, have a look at what we're doing. Mm. Uh, is it all right if I give this a plug? Mate, so, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, right. so yeah, correct. Get online on our website. Yes. Book a demo. Yep. Just book a demo and we'll set something up over Zoom and show you the product. But I, I think December, Jan is the time. December in particular, as things start to wind down, yep, go and have your long lunches. But start investing some time figuring out how 2019 you can do things differently because our technology can really help help drive that and do it quickly. So get online, book a demo. We'll show you how it works, and you know your clients are going to love it in January. So I got a product. Biased. I got a product question. Yep. Are you getting many um, many advisors using My Prosperity as a lead generation tool? We are. In fact, yeah, client acquisition. Yeah. It's on the increase, definitely, yeah. um, because you've got to think about it. If you've got an advisor that's asking you to fill out a fact form on paper, it ain't a good experience. Yeah. But if you're an advisor that can go, hey, here's my branded app, because we yep. can do branded apps uh, yeah, for clients. It's great. You've got the whole client experience. So they walk out of your office with their financial world in their back pocket. Yep. That's cool. So definitely we're seeing uh, more innovative advisors wanting to get on board, and we prov- we provide that out of the box as a white label app or you can have yes. your own branded app. Yep. Um, no better way to have that digital engagement because I think what a lot of advisors are now thinking, how do I remain relevant to the new demographic coming through that are more tech savvy? Correct. And you'd be surprised, even some of the pre-retirees, they're all using apps. So <laughs> yeah. you should have one. Yes. So I think um, definitely as a – and this is exactly what played out at zero. You know, um, we had – because, uh, you know, and I'm not trying to make a big statement, but zero cloud accounting transformed the industry. You know, it really did. Oh, man, of course. And, you know, you look at it now and, you, th- you know, we were seeing advisors, accountants that, you know, your typical career roadmap for an accountant way back when was, you know, stay in a big firm, work 20 years, become a partner, just go through that whole journey. We started seeing accountants leaving these young, innovative, typically young, not always, but often young, innovative, tech-savvy accountants going, man, I'm going to use technology to get a leg up. And, you know, I remember one of them, funny story, I had dinner with one of the, it was one of the big firms and I had this this young guy, just, you know, product champion for, for Zero, 
And he said, oh, I've resigned. I went, no. Oh, it's like one of our strategic accounts. This is in the early days. And he goes, but you just made it really easy for me to do this on my own now. <laughs> and then he came to ZeroCon about eight months later. I go, How are you going? He's got oh, 124 clients. Yeah, what? So that was his acquisition was going to small business going, how are you doing your accounting? Let me show you a better way. And they go, oh, my God, that's so cool. <laughs> so he was using Zero, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then some of the add-ons as a differentiation point. And we're seeing that now with my prosperity. Yeah, so I know advisors advisor, that have done exactly that. You know, come and I'll show you yeah. how advice can be different. Yeah. We'll get you in control. Yeah. you got a mobile app. Yeah. you got everything in one place. Um, if I think back to my advice days when I used to do cash flow, I used to do a lot of cash flow. And the moment where, and I had this awesome uh, Excel spreadsheet where we'd put how much they received after tax, how frequently, yada, 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 and then spread it across fixed cost bucket and all these different. And for the first time ever, they saw their their day-to-day financial life in mm. front of them on yeah. a big screen. And that there was always a palpable moment where they went, that's me. That's my life. That is... And and they look at me and they go, wow, you're the guy that's able to put my entire financial, my day-to-day financial life in front of me. Yeah. And so basically what you're saying is my prosperity does something like that, but for all the different future and long-term aspects of their life and their, their assets and whatnot. Yeah. So, um, mate, look, it's awesome to have you on. This time we didn't even cut out and uh, <laughs> yeah, if we, if we stopped moving, it yeah, video is still rolling. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So we got through. Appreciate it, mate. Good on you. Thank you very much. Cheers, Chris. Thank you, mate. Cheers.